Well, good afternoon. It's a Friday afternoon at half term, and Julian and I were wondering if maybe that's why attendance is slightly down on, on the usual, but we've got a good crowd out there and a bright crowd. And so we're looking very much forward to your questions and discussions uh, during the discussion session. Today, we're going to be looking at insuring against policy risk. Uh, this might sound a little bit circular in that uh, an insur there is also an insurance policy, but if you look at the insurance policy effectively as a contract, uh, what we're going to be exploring today is how do you insure against government policy risk? Changes in the government's stated uh, route of travel, uh, the government's stated line of reasoning of how it would apply a particular uh, goal uh, to existing decisions that need to be made. So uh, it's going to be a fun and interesting afternoon. You all know me. I'm Michael Minelli. I'm the executive chairman of Zien. Uh, and it truly is my delight to be able to uh, introduce these really fun webinars that we get to have. And this is a good fun one for a Friday afternoon, for sure, here in London, where it's a little bit uh, damp and rainy. Uh, our sponsors allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. And many of them are involved in uh, either as financial centers or supplying systems to people in the financial services sector or are, in fact, uh, uh, in the insurance sector itself. Uh, today's uh, schedule is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, my job is to get out of the way and let you hear from our expert, Julian, so I'll be off in a second. Uh, Julian's going to be speaking for about 20 to 25 minutes about what he does at uh, Parhelion and what they're doing there. And he'll give you some examples. We've got four polls, so fingers on buzzers, please. Uh, that they'll, they'll be coming up. And as ever, we have the Q&A facility provided by the GoToWebinar system that we're using. Please remember to use your questions, send them through that chat question facility. Uh, that way I see them, I'll feed them into the conversation. No point in emailing me, I'm here with you, so I'll only get the email afterwards. If any of you would like to be put directly in touch with Julian, please just say so and we'll arrange that uh, after. We can do that also through the chat room. And anybody who asks a question, uh, if Julian is unable to uh, finish that, we'll make sure that he gets your question and he can he can uh, get in direct contact with you. So meant to be a vibrant and interactive discussion and a way to meet people and network. Well, Julian, uh, with no further ado, I, I think uh, people can read your CV online and things like that, well, and they wouldn't be here if they hadn't read it anyway. Uh, so what have you got to say about insuring against policy risk? The floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, welcome everyone on a Friday afternoon. Um, as Michael says, we're going to be talking about policy risk. So let's just uh, pop onto the next slide, please, Michael. We're going to um, look at the question of does policy risk matter? Well, there's a bit of a spoiler alert. Of course, yes, it does matter. Uh, otherwise, this would be rather a short talk. But we want to look at you know why it matters and put it in some context and look at the sources of uh, policy risk. We're also going to be differentiating between political risk and policy risk. And there is some really important differences to understand there. Um, and then we're going to look at whether it's insurable, how it can be insured, and then look at a uh, or, or what, what's available today, and then also propose a future model uh, called the policy risk insurance mechanism. We'll look at its benefits, where it sits in relation to other initiatives, um, and even look at some case studies. And then, as Michael said, we'll also be running a couple of polls throughout the uh, uh, talk to get, capture some of your insights and your thoughts. Um, so do stay awake and fingers on the, fingers on the buzzers. So, yeah, uh, I'm Julian Richardson. I founded Parhelion uh, back in 2006, and we're a specialist uh, on climate finance and energy risk. Um, we work in non-traditional risk issues impacting investment into climate finance and sustainable investment opportunities. We do both advisory and transactional work. We work with a whole range of uh, stakeholders, including policymakers, investors, multilaterals, the insurance market and uh, project developers. But that's enough about us. Let's get into the meat of it. Next slide, please. So. Does policy risk matter? Well, yes, of course it does. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a $14 trillion uh, interest rate swap market. But actually, policy uh, risk is mattering even more today than it ever has before. And that's because we're moving from a high carbon to a low carbon economy. 
and po policy is critical to facilitate this transaction. It's what economists call internalizing externalities. And we're seeing more and more uh, institutions and organizations making net zero pledges. Over 450 cities have made a net zero pledges, over a thousand businesses, uh, um, investors representing trillions and trillions of dollars, all pledging net zero. And without correct policy in place, those pledges would not be able, would not have been made, and nor would they be able to be delivered. So policy really matters. And the sums involved in the value shift taking place from this high carbon to a low carbon economy into a more sustainable world uh, are huge. The World Economic Forum looked at uh, sustainable infrastructure and estimated that that alone is worth $4 trillion every year up until 2030. So the numbers are big. And if you're thinking about sustainable infrastructure specifically, of course, the investment cycles are a lot longer than the political cycles. So how do we overcome this mismatch where investors are trying to deploy capital for 10, 15, 20 years, but policymakers are only in position for four or five years? It also matters to policymakers because they are, uh, they are seeking to forward their political agenda and their political mandate, and therefore they are implementing policies. And with these risks, investors have only four choice, as with all risks. They can accept the risk, they can transfer it, they can mitigate it, or they can avoid it completely. Now, if they look at the policy risk and see it too high, they will simply avoid it, and the policy objectives will not be delivered. So policy risk matters all round. Next slide, please, Michael. One of the biggest areas we're looking at is um, putting a price on these externalities, in particular carbon uh, and uh, environmental emissions. And this is a key policy objective uh, globally. We have 61 carbon pricing initiatives being implemented, and these are split roughly between carbon taxes and emissions trading schemes or environmental commodity markets. These cover nearly 80 national and subnational regions. And policymakers tend to like these uh, instruments. They are an important way for them to generate uh, revenue to their exchequers. Uh, last year, $45 billion of carbon pricing revenue flowed into government uh, exchequers. And investors are also responding to them with over 14,000 uh, low carbon projects registered, reducing over 4 billion tons of emissions. Pyhelium, working with Standard & Poor's a number of years ago, undertook a risk mapping exercise to look and identify and map the barriers to climate finance flows. Working with the stakeholders, they identified 28 distinct risks. Ten of those, so over a third, were policy related. And in fact, the highest and most, uh, both for severity and frequency, was indeed policy related risks. We've also been working on biofuels projects in the US and elsewhere around the world. And we've seen that some of these projects rely on policy-backed revenue streams for over 50% of their revenues. So if those policies go away or are changed or watered down, that has a significant impact on the profitability of these projects. Next slide, please, Michael. So clearly policy risk does matter, but policy risk doesn't just come from uh, policy makers. It can also come through uh, the judicial route. Now, the separation of power is a well-established doctrine, but of course, it's not always as black and white. And the gigantic battle of Supreme Court appointments that we've seen recently in the States demonstrates this clearly. But similarly, governments need flexibilities to implement the mandates for which they're elected. They have to respond to new technologies, new information, changing economic backdrops, and so on. But at the end of the day, policy risk is just another business risk that businesses have to deal with, and it should be managed accordingly. But how can a company manage, uh, manage these risks? Well, for interest rates, we have the swap market, which is great. But otherwise, 
businesses have tended to rely on the dark arts of public affairs, who, with corporations and individuals peddling access to senior policymakers. But access does not guarantee influence, and nor should it. Transparency is, is important, and so there must be a better way to deal with policy risk. Next slide, please, Michael. Before I go on too much uh, further, I just want to make this important distinction between political risk and policy risk. Political risk is something that we've, uh, the, the world has dealt with for a long time, uh, and it has a well-established market going back to the 1970s when uh, investors were faced with nationalization and expropriatory action um, uh, in different countries. And out of that established the political risk insurance market. Political risk insurance market, however, covers only illegal changes in law. So those changes of, or those acts of expropriation or deprivation or non-honoring of a sovereign obligation uh, have to be contrary to interna international law. And for that, you can buy insurance. Typically, it's also only available in developing and emerging economies. And it is also only available to third country investors in those economies. And the whole point of political risk insurance was to facilitate trade to those developing economies. And there is established market providers. MEGA is part of the World Bank. Africa Trade Indemnity is a sort of MEGA by Africa for Africa. Lloyds of London and other private sector providers uh, can provide up to about $3 billion of political risk insurance capacity and uh, can take risks for up to 20 years. Policy risk, on the other hand, is nothing about, it makes no distinction between the legitimacy or otherwise of the change in policy that a government or otherwise is implementing. It also affects both developed and developing economies alike, and it impacts investors, whether they be domestic or third country investors. But importantly, Insurance is generally not available or only on a very limited basis. So these are important distinctions. Right, if we go to the next slide, Michael, we have the first poll. We're going to ask the same question three times. Uh, and it's just looking differently at your perceptions of policy risk about clean energy pol policy, firstly in the UK, secondly in uh, EU, and lastly in the US. So the first Julian, poll, yeah. Just, just, just two quick things from the audience. Uh, one, just uh, is, that def is that definition of policy risk as clear in the, say, the London insurance markets as the definition of political risk? Uh, well, I don't think the London insurance market really has a, a definition of policy risk. They know yeah. what po political risk is. Um, but I don't think they really think about policy risk uh, as we're discussing it here. Okay. And just before we launch the poll, uh, could you give an example of a policy risk uh, in an energy project, a policy risk change, just to help the audience get their head around these questions? Yeah. So if we, we, we talked about some of the uh, uh, putting a price on carbon uh, and in the European Union, uh, when they first set up the European Emissions Trading Scheme, you were able to uh, acquire uh, offsets uh, in the international market that were generated under the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, and this is where we did some transactions uh, and first we started first looking at this. Now, these projects that were being invested in, they generated their revenue from, yes, they sold uh, whatever goods or output the uh, project generated, whether that be clean energy or otherwise, but they also got a significant proportion of their revenue from carbon permits or from a feed-in tariff or some sort of revenue stream that only existed because a policy said it existed. Thank you. Just, just, just to give it a little bit there. So as Julian said, we're now launching our first poll. Uh, if you were investing in a clean energy project in the UK, how much over base uh, would you want as an investor to address policy risk? So over base interest rates, how much extra would you want? And uh, as Julian said, we'll be seeing uh, uh, two more uh, polls in just a minute. So just there. Fingers on buzzers. 
well over the halfway mark. I'll close this in about another five or 10 seconds. Okay, uh, so I'm just gonna close. Uh, I'll sh share that one if I might. And you can see the results there, Julian. So uh, the vast majority were happy to do sort of not to 5% over base. Okay. Great. And I'll now go ahead and launch the second one, which is the uh, same question, but this time uh, very much based around the EU. Of course, people's perceptions will change depending on which EU country, but uh, just take your pick and uh, uh, vote accordingly. So fingers on buzzers again, folks. My gosh, they are swift this time. Our Skinnerian mice are learning very rapidly. <laughs> this one is much quicker. So I'll close this poll now with the same number having voted. Great. And again, sharing that with you. Again, fairly, uh, in fact, uh, it would appear that they're trusting uh, the EU even more. Great. And then if I can, I will now move to our third poll of four. And the same question uh, now with the US. So fingers on buzzers again, folks. So slightly more trust in the EU than the UK. Yeah, a, a skinnier middle though, I notice, Michael. Mm. Okay. And we're up to the same number having voted again. Thank you very much, folks, for being so fast. Let me just share that with you. Ta -da. Well, uh, and seeing the US is quite risky. Uh, and possibly even higher than average uh, or normal, simply because we've got an election coming on Tuesday. So, uh, yeah, right. So well, indeed, if we ask that same question uh, in a week's time or in a few months' time, we might get a very different answer, of course. Very good. Anyway, Julian, the floor is yours again. Thank you. All right. So is policy risk insurable? In short, yes, but only to a very, very limited extent. We have successfully managed to do a limited number of transactions. And what we found is that the underwriting appetite at the maximum is somewhere between 100 and $200 million. And that's a policy limit that would only, or an insurance limit that could only be used once. When we talked about the political risk market, we talked about an, an aggregate limit of up to $3 billion. So, but, and that $3 billion could be used many times over. Here, we're talking about a very limited uh, uh, aggregate capacity, uh, and it's only available once. And it's important to know why that, that is. And that's the first point about aggregation. Policy risk aggregates uh, perfectly, and its correlation coefficient is one. So if you insure 100 projects against one policy, if that one policy is changed, it affects all projects. And therefore, it's impossible to get any diversification, something that insurers, of course, always look to. When they insure 100 cars, they never expect to lose 100 all at once. Um, so this correlation is a big challenge for the private sector to deal with in um, uh, offering any sort of coverage related to policy change. Of course, it's also very difficult to create a robust actuarial pricing model to price that risk. And therefore, when it does come to pricing, it's much more about the insurers being able to take a view and see what money is available to purchase the cover. Interestingly enough, our finding is that actually there is generally good money available to cover this risk. Because when policy risk gets to a certain level, debt providers reluctant to accept it. And this means projects have to be fully funded with equity, and this becomes quite expensive. So by using insurance to reduce the policy risk, you are able to then entice debt providers in, into the structure and reduce the overall cost of capital, releasing sufficient uh, 
funding and value to uh, transfer some of that risk to the insurance market. And this is aligning the different forms of capital to effectively manage the risk. Insurers, of course, will also think about the pricing because whilst it is perfectly correlated within its own, uh, own risk, policy risk itself is uncorrelated to any other risks that insurers are facing or, or underwriting. And so there is some diversification benefits there. But for this to work, ultimately, there needs to be very strong stakeholder alignment. And without that, and without common ground being found, it's very difficult to do. Equally, uh, you must also check for moral hazard and ensure that anything that's in, issued is in line with public interest. So let's just talk about a possible model for future uh, delivery of policy risk solutions. We've called it policy risk insurance mechanisms, largely because I'm from the insurance industry and not the marketing industry, uh, and we don't spend time thinking about these uh, creative names. But here is a model where we think we can massively scale up the available coverage available to investors. It's a way to crowd in private sector underwriting capital and also mobilize private sector capital to, for investment. We do, after all, have a considerable track record in using public finance to leverage private capital. This would, uh, the, the proposed mechanism would be, could start with one or more countries uh, where the country commits to uh, having its own capital at risk, and by having its own capital at risk, it can then crowd in other sources of capital because you create that alignment of interest that we mentioned earlier. And by adding in that, uh, and, and by having that alignment of interest with uh, those most able to influence the outcome, i.e. the policy makers, having some exposure to those decisions, you create uh, um, that alignment and you also uh, enable other people to come in alongside you. Ultimately, this uh, could apply to any country and in each country could have individual cells um, and the level of their commitment could be, uh, could be varied and their level of participation can be varied not only by country by country, but also by policy by policy. It could be done on a standalone basis or it could be hosted by an existing institution, for instance, MEGA or the World Bank. But, uh, and in the end, there could be multiple cells covering multiple countries, and, it, and indeed, there could even be a mutualized element to it, uh, with countries helping to keep each other honest. And that way, you would be able to access the reinsurance market and private sector capital. Next slide, please, Michael. So what are the benefits of this policy risk insurance mechanism? Well, essentially, there are many. In the first instance, it will enhance the regulatory competitiveness of the country that uh, participates in it. And it will help create investment grade policy. Investment grade policy is something that's been talked about for a long time, um, but it's not always easy to achieve or define. Uh, and by creating uh, uh, investment grade policy, the policy makers ensure their policy objectives are more likely to be delivered. Importantly, it also creates a source of revenue uh, and profit for those host country governments. The reason for this is, as shareholders in their own uh, cell within the uh, policy risk insurance mechanism, they will receive premium uh, from uh, the investors buying the coverage, and that premium can ultimately be returned to the, the shareholders as dividends. And since the policy policy makers are in charge of whether there is a loss that's ever created, they have the it's up to them whether they actually make any money out of this or not. As I said, the alignment of interest is critical. And that not only um, putting money on the table, but it creates a much wider confidence in, in the policy and the country itself and it also crowds in other sources of capital. It becomes a very efficient way to use public funding, and the, it does entrench uh, policy objectives, but importantly, it doesn't lose the government flexibility 
or infringe on parliamentary sovereignty in any way. Of course, this is important because governments are elected based to implement a particular mandate and they must be at liberty to do that. But they must also understand the consequences and bear some of that risk. So this has a, uh, some elegance in uh, creating policy certainty and creating investment grade policy um, with very little downside without tying the, the hands of future governments to implement the mandates for which they're elected. If we go to the next slide, please, Michael. This is uh, uh, just to, to position where the policy risk insurance mechanism might sit relative to other similar institutions and uh, uh, options that cover political risk today. On the left, of course, we have MEGA um, and other parts of the World Bank can issue partial risk guarantees. We have the private sector insurers uh, and the US equivalent of OPIC. And there are many other, uh, other similar institutions around the world. I won't go through these in detail, but it gives you a, a, a guide to see how this uh, can, can fit in relative to those. If we go to the next slide, please, Michael. So there's a couple of case studies here. It's the sort of good but not perfect in the case of Germany and the damn right bad and ugly in the case of Ontario and Canada. Now, you might think the Canadians are uh, a nice, calm, uh, considered level-headed uh, uh, bunch, of, bunch of folks, um, but they really outdid themselves in 2018 uh, when, after many years establishing a cap-and-trade emissions trading scheme, uh, an incoming um, uh, provincial government simply tore up uh, the emissions trading scheme. This caused huge impact not only on the domestic um, participants in that scheme, who'd been spent a lot of management time and effort to get in compliance with the scheme, but since the scheme was also linked with California, uh, it also impacted the California participants. And so there was some entanglement there that had to be undone. The, uh, watch, the fiscal watchdog for Ontario um, estimated the impact of was $300 million uh, on uh, Ontario itself. Um, uh, and that's even before you consider the environmental and reputational impact. Germany, on the other hand, has generally been pretty good, but as I said earlier, not perfect. It's had a long established uh, mechanism to support the installation of solar PV with 20 year time horizons and the tariffs have been closely linked to digress over time to match the advances in technology and the cost reduction and match the delivery of the policy objective. And this is uh, an example where policy has had that TLC. It's been transparent, long and clear. And as such, Germany was able to advance 57% of the global small scale investments, investment. There are, of course, arguments as to whether the, uh, uh, the cost of energy in Germany um, is too high. But actually, once you fig figure in the uh, significant employment that was created, um, tax revenues and other things, it actually works out a very effective way of doing it. So with that, I would just like to close with a final poll. So fingers on your bot buttons again, if you wouldn't mind. And just as a, uh, a matter of interest, I'd like to know if an insurance solution were available to cover a project you're working on or a project you've uh, come across, would you buy it? Simple as that. Just give me a few more seconds there. Everyone's back in training. And I'll close the poll now and share the results. That's fairly conclusive. Well, you're a good salesman, Julian, I think. <laughs> well, it wasn't a sales pitch. It was good. Well, at that point, I'd like to say thank you very much to Michael for hosting this. Uh, I hope you found it useful. And I'm happy to try and answer any questions or at least discuss some possible answers.
Well, that was super. And please, uh, please, folks, if you want your questions answered, do get them in quickly because we've got about uh, uh, about uh, ten to twelve minutes to to talk this through. Um, well, Julian, that was fascinating in, in so so many ways. Um, I was wondering if you might want to uh, just touch on, uh, for example, uh, technology policy risk. So we've had um, we've had, for example, Germany uh, deciding that it's it was going after Fukushima non-nuclear almost instantly. Uh, is that something could be covered? Uh, a second area here in the UK, a lot of people were developing hydrogen. Uh, the government decided to bring forward its uh, non-petrol um, uh, declaration to 2035, or perhaps it's talking even 2030. Well, at this point, hydrogen folks are saying we won't have anything ready in time, and therefore it will be dominated by electric uh, battery vehicles of some form. But that's certainly what they're claiming. Uh, do you think that this is the sort of thing that this type of policy risk could cover? Definitely, maybe which is not a not a terribly helpful answer. But uh, yes, in theory, why not? Provided you can get the structuring right and you can get that all important alignment of interest. And, uh, you know, if you want to have, uh, you know, a small amount of coverage available, then um, you will just have to approach the uh, insurance market and hope you can get someone to take a view but really that's really asking them to take take a, a, a bit of a punt and is there enough money on the table for them to do that mm. and even if, to get them to take a view you need to have a really robust analysis not only of the politics but also the political process that could lead to that change and why it would change if that argument can be made then there is the it's quite there's a good chance that you can find someone that will share in some of those risks so without being uh, definitive um, definitely maybe uh, what about something like the UK's declaration for net zero carbon in 2050 I mean a lot of people have said that's a that's a heck of a stretch target the government has said oh it's legally binding which means it takes itself to court in 2050 I'm not sure what that it particularly achieves um, but uh, is that something that this this sort of program could cover? I think you know, I think you'd be uh, it would be difficult to argue that that's actually a policy rather than a stated ambition. But mm. I'm sure there'll be people that might disagree with with me on that. I, you know, I know some of the people that were behind the Climate Act that uh, um, created uh, uh, government's obligations to. Uh, uh, to make these commitments and then deliver on them. And of course, since then they have been, in, uh, you know, made more and more ambitious. Um, uh, and so what what that net zero ambition does, it makes an ambition, but it doesn't tell you how to get there. It doesn't define the policies that people are responding to. Right. So falling out of that objective or ambition are or should be a whole host of policies that will deliver that ambition so the underlying policies are more likely to be you could get get your head around them get your hands around them and perhaps come up with a, uh, a something rather than a, a, a grand ambition like net zero well it's interesting you've helped clarify in my own mind we've been proposing policy performance bonds for things like such targets and you're quite right this is about almost the policies that would lead to those targets altering so that's a that's a good distinction there. Thank you. Um, now, in one of your slides, you spoke about countries, but um, I immediately was thinking about uh, municipalities uh, around the world. Andrew Ross is asking, can cities in the UK uh, set up this type of insurance structure for their own municipal green bonds? I think that's a really interesting question. And um, why not? I think that would be something really interesting to explore, actually. Um, uh, and there's a way of uh, linking central government policy to uh, uh, domestic uh, uh, finance. So if you have a, uh, a policy that has been implemented to which the uh, local authorities are responding and linking their actions to, to that policy, why, why not? OK. Um, Jeremy Hindle's got a good question as well. Uh, do you see the insurance coverage being an annual policy or something longer? Uh, 
Um, and would this change the amount of capacity available? Yeah, so um, we've the transa few transactions we've done, and, and you can count them on one hand, uh, they have been for more than a year, but less than three. Uh, and I think as you further you get out in terms of duration, uh, the less capacity will be available. So, for instance, we talked about three billion dollars uh, of capacity being available in the political risk markets. That was for tenors of uh, up to three or five years. Political risk market can do tenors of 20 years, but the available capacity drops significantly then. Uh, insurers really, you know, um, find it difficult to go out that that longer uh, uh, duration. So um, this is why, you know, we need a scheme to enable insurers to both commit more capacity and for a longer period to enable investors to take advantage of uh, of, of what's really not there at the moment. It's only there in a very small way. Are you able to say what the, those on the fingers of one hand, uh, what the risks that they were covering were? Uh, they were related to some of these, a uh, couple were related to uh, carbon pricing transactions um, uh, uh, and environmental commodity markets in particular. Yep. We've had lots of other inquiries around uh, feed-in tariffs. You will, uh, a lot of people will remember, of course, that uh, Spain, somewhat shot itself in its foot and almost completely truncated the, the investment into the solar uh, industry when it um, reneged or, or backdated some changes to its feed-in tariff. Um, uh, we would have liked to have done a lot more around that and think if, um, but it, this is the nature of uh, insurance. When when the risk isn't you know when when the risk isn't in someone's face, people think oh well it's never going to happen, and then suddenly it happens and you know it's the sort of uh, stable door and horse analogy, and the and the phone starts ringing off the hook. Um, but um, the time to put these instruments in place is before the uh, horse has bolted, um, and would like to would like to see more. We are actively working on a couple of a number of transactions at the moment. Though. Yeah, that is the classic problem with insurance. We live in a universe where time goes forwards and not backwards. It's <laughs> kind of strange, isn't it? Time's all right. Um, uh, just quickly, one of the one of the great things about insurance, of course, is the, the need to prove you know loss. So it's not the event that triggers it; it's the loss. Because a lot of people would look at this and say, uh, or might say, well, why don't you go and look at the betting markets for this? You know, if uh, now that that, that yeah. to some degree, I think you know there, there, are sub, start, there are substantial sums now being laid um, on all sorts of political events, not least one due next week. Uh, this started, I think, with the uh, Iowa electronic markets back in the 90s when it was a bit frivolous, but it's become a, a genuine industry. Um, but there's a big distinction between that and what you're talking about, isn't there? And it, there is, but not perhaps as big as <laughs> as you might think. And um, it is also important to understand the difference between, you know, a partial loss and a total loss. Uh, and, you know, the perception of a change in policy, perhaps watering down a feed-in tariff, as opposed to cancelling it ab initio, um, is a very different risk. Um, it's not always easy, but it's normally possible to find some sort of way to demonstrate what the loss is. Mm -hmm. uh, either by thinking about it in sort of parametric terms or agreeing, a, you know, on an agreed indemnity basis um, before the policy incepts. Yeah. Um, Zoe uh, Layton has a has one. Uh, we, no, no, no webinar uh, in these days with all of us chained to our desks would be complete without a reference to COVID-19. So, Zoe, don't be embarrassed. I think it's a good question. Uh, she says, this is slightly off topic. I don't think it is. I think it's on topic. I value Julian's opinion. Some have described the black swan event of this year to be not the actual pandemic, but rather the government's reaction to it. Uh, have you given thought to this with regard to policy work, uh, policy risk in your work this year? No. Um, and it's interesting. It's a sort of, um, you know, 
what Zoe is talking about there is policy responses rather than sort of um, policy that's been put in place and then and then changed. Um, uh, I think it will be really difficult to uh, underwrite, uh, you know, future responses to an undefined event. Um, but uh, it's an interesting question, and I think she's right to make the distinction between the pandemic itself and, and, and different governments' responses around the world. Um, let, let, let me pick up on Zoe here, and I'm not trying. It's just, let's imagine, though, say next March, uh, the government comes to a conclusion that a vaccination is very, very unlikely. Okay, and it then says, well, uh, listen, uh, we've decided we're going to keep a two meter rule uh, on separation or something. And I'm in, say, an events industry. And I've worked out, uh, I'm making this up on the fly, but I've worked out that what I could do is on my sort of uh, my event pitch, I could add another floor and that gets me enough capacity to run things. So I've basically decided to buy it because it's two meters and I get a policy risk on the distance. And then the government one day says, oh, well, actually one meter will do. So all of my competitors are doing fine and I'm the one who invested in this enormous uh, increase in capacity. Now, uh, so are you saying it's really kind of just the time, the, the fact that policy is changing so fast right now or that you could never do this if, the, if, the, if it slowed down a bit and the government was actually projecting out? Yeah, it's it's really difficult. I, I'd love to answer this more definitively, but I, I would have to think about it a, a, a little bit more. I mean, there's the difference between you know the the the, the you know general business risk uh, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and these types of insurance risk. I mean, it would be interesting if uh, uh, there's always the opportunity to get some of the, to to entice an insurer to get some of the upside, right? So you could say, well. Um, Take this, take this risk, and if if the uh, insure if the government policy changes in a positive way, that might have worked out well for the events planner, and then mm -hmm. the insurer could get some an additional premium based on some of the the upside. Mm -hmm. um, but everything, all these types of things really do have to be structured very specifically. Um, they're not off the shelf products and they're not off the shelf transactions. So. I'm, I'm slightly hedging my bets because it, you really need to think about these carefully and make sure those alignments of interest there. Um, you've got well-defined triggers and uh, an ability to, you know, adjust a loss if, if, if and when it happens. Uh, Julian, I've got uh, people uh, saying how, how good it's been and how interesting, actually. So always a great sign, but it's also a sign I need to bring things to a close. So they're going to be heading off. Is there anything you'd just like to say in conclusion? Uh, I, th I would like to thank everyone for joining us on a Friday afternoon. I'd like to thank you, Michael, for facilitating this. Um, I would be happy to engage with any of the uh, audience if they would like to explore you know, what's available today or if they would like to explore or collaborate on what might be available tomorrow. Um, I'll leave that as an invitation. Well, thank you so much. Uh, just give me a moment. I've got three rounds of thanks to give. Um, the first, uh, 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 and for a second time, is to our sponsors. Again, folks, your ability to support us in, in exploring all these wonderful avenues where technology and economics and finance meet is, is really admirable, and we appreciate it enormously. Um, please take a good look at the, uh, the list of sponsors there, folks, and perhaps even think of putting your name up there. Um, I'd like to also thank the audience. Uh, it's been an interesting session today. Uh, and I think a little bit uh, ahead of the curve and a bit out there for us. So we've had our thinking caps on, um, but also our fingers on buzzers. So thank you for being so prompt. We do have a number of webinars. Uh, a very heavily subscribed one uh, next week is on Tuesday, looking at what's going on with challenger banks. Um, on Thursday, we're going to dip back into insurance again. And we're going to have uh, Ika Swahi here, who's the Secretary General of the Insurance Development Forum. And she's going to be looking at the global picture of what's going on. And perhaps uh, some of you today can join that and ask her questions about uh, Julian's thinking. Uh, and then finally, on Friday, lessons from lockdown um, and how to manage your share plans uh, in a digital way. So uh, this is going to be part of our employee share ownership series. So 
please, uh, but by all means, come to those next week. Um, but of course, my real thanks has to go to you, Julian. Uh, you seem to have identified a really interesting place between what I might call, you know, political risk uh, and the idea of the bonds and targets that we spoke about, maybe even gambling. Uh, but this idea of policy risk, I think, has a long way to go. And I think particularly as we're looking at areas where China declared a national ETS coming into force next year, uh, you're going to be seeing the, the, the small number that you've already done uh, potentially grow in just that area of carbon. Uh, but I think the model that you put forward in, in your prime model is one that I think a lot of uh, governmental entities, if I can call it that vaguely, really ought to think about because they don't spend enough time explaining to business people that they really are going to support these policies rather than just changing them, as you indicated, for example, in Spain. So thank you so much for sharing these thoughts. Um, I really appreciate you going out there and I think it's very thought provoking. Unfortunately, uh, during COVID, I'm unable uh, to open the floodgates of applause because everybody's hidden behind uh, the system. But on behalf of the audience, if I may, I will give my Korean karmic clapper a bang uh, from a proper Buddhist temple in Bogoksa. Uh, Thank you very much, Julian. It's been a Pleasure. real delight, and uh, I look forward to seeing this grow. And uh, maybe we should pick up on this, uh, uh, perhaps next year, late next year, when you, you hopefully you're seeing more examples coming through. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you.